It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, starring the inexhaustible Don Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing this? This morning, That's John. me. Was I, was, I was in such suspense waiting to know what uh, adjective you would use for me today. Inexhaustible. I like that one. That's a good one. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, well, I figured incomprehensible wasn't really a, appropriate, but I, but people are paying attention. They, they'll notice I have changed up the adjectives. You've been the inevitable John Hersey and the ineluctable John Hersey and the, uh, you know, the incomparable John Hersey. So, uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, I know you did a heroic deed today, but before we get to our, our hero du jour of battling with the Massachusetts bureaucrats, didn't you? Stand it up to them. Indeed, I did. How'd it go? Just got out of a hearing with a, a lawyer. He didn't seem to like his job much, and I don't blame him, but he had to take my statement. I'm uh, appealing the health care mandate penalty, something like $1,500 that they want me to pay for not having health care. So, uh, Thank you, Mitt yeah, Romney, right? Yeah, thank you, Mitt Romney. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's one of the three little rhino girls, you know, in the Senate, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, and Mitt Romney. So, you know, we expect this kind of socialist programs uh, from him. Anyhow, uh, we don't want to dwell on the bad news. Hopefully you win that case, John, uh, you know, against, we'll see. The, uh, the, yeah, against the in intrusive, uh, morally indefensible bureaucrats. But um, we have a real hero to discuss this week, as uh, as we usually do, James Madison. I mean, father of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, that's uh, he's certainly certainly one of the one of the greatest figures of the American founding. So, let me give, let me give the dates, and then we could we uh, you could jump in with some of the biographical information. Seventeen fifty one to eighteen thirty six. So he's one of the younger uh, fo founders. You know, in his thirties, when he's doing this great work on the Constitution, and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention uh, your boy later, John Benjamin Franklin, who we did a whole show on, and who we, we probably agree is the greatest American in history. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get Franklin's assessment of the of the Constitution at the end of the Constitutional Convention, which I thought was yo know, showed uh, Frank yo know, if Madison is one of the youngest of the founders, Franklin was the oldest. Was Franklin was born I think in 1806, I think. So, yep. um, uh, yeah, I think it was 1806 to 1890 for, for Franklin. But anyhow, inter interesting detail. I'm sorry, yeah, did I say 1806? Uh, yeah, did, I think yeah. pretty soon. I'm, I knew it. Yeah, said. pretty soon. I'm gonna, sorry, John, pretty soon I'm going to sound like Joe Biden, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, well, let's hope not. 1706 to 1790 for Franklin. Um, Madison. 1751 to 1836. Interesting. Well, you want you want to talk about his childhood at all? Nah. Well, I did want to mention that <laughs> you probably knew this, but on this day in 1789, the U.S. Congress proposed to the state legislatures a series of constitutional amendments. You guys might have heard of these, right? Guaranteeing specific okay. freedoms to all Americans. So we salute you, James Madison, for spearheading the Bill of Rights. We'll talk later, I'm sure. I don't want to preempt that part of our conversation about his sort of ambivalence toward them at first and his growing acceptance of the idea and then actually being the guy to spearhead it. But that's what we're celebrating today, everybody. This day in 1789, James Madison, is uh, his achievement, it moved forward to the state legislatures. One of yeah. many achievements. Yeah, I, I mean, the, uh, the U.S. Constitution, where, where Madison was the, you know, the main the driving force of the U.S. Constitution, and then the Bill of Rights, where he was virtually the sole, the sole author. These have to be not just his greatest achievements, but amongst you know the greatest political achievements of, of history. So obviously, we'll focus the show on the, on that. Uh, interesting about Madison's a few interesting things about Madison's personal life um, uh, or, or his early life before we get to the you know the big time uh, achievements. Is first of all, he was sickly. I mean, he was he was a kind of tiny, he's like five foot three or five foot four, frail, sickly. You know, most of his life they called him poor Jemmy. You know, uh, because yeah, and they always thought he was going to die. Uh, whereas Jefferson, his buddy Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, was a physically powerful. You know, six foot three, robustly strong, never sick, 
always healthy. And of course, Jefferson died at age 83 and Madison died at age 85. Right? So, I mean, so, I mean go, go figure. <laughs> you never, you know, yeah. you, you never know. In fact, Madison <laughs> didn't attend the uh, normal Virginian College of William and Mary because, you know, he, he, there, that, that place was diseased. And they were afraid that if he went to William and Mary, he'd die. So they shipped him off to Princeton, where it was called College of New Jersey at the time, where, as you know, he became one of John Witherspoon's uh, greatest students. John Witherspoon being the uh, right. president of College of New Jersey. Right. Yeah, Serious I was going to mention Enlightenment that. figure. Exactly. Exactly. I was going to mention, you know, that... You, you, you're exactly right. No William and Mary. Usually the Virginia aristocrats went to William and Mary. Certainly, certainly uh, uh, Jefferson did. But yeah, the school that later became Princeton. And you're right about the Enlightenment scholar Witherspoon. Uh, Madison did a lot of reading in, in the enlight leading Enlightenment figures. And you could see you could see their influence uh, on him in his, 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 his high regard for religious freedom, uh, for individual liberties. If eliminating the power of uh, of the state, he became um, in two ways, right? But both key points of the Enlightenment, the epistemologically, you know, in regards to how human beings gain knowledge, the commitment to rationalism, irrationalism in the broad sense, in which it contrasts with irrationalism, not rationalism in the narrow sense where it contrasts with empiricism. But he's a, you know committed committed to rational thinking. Uh, not the big faith guy. This, you know, some historians believe he was a deist. Um, you mean he, what, what's the old deist theory? God created the world to, to run in accordance with natural law, and he doesn't interfere anymore. So there's no miracles. You know, there's no point in prayer because God doesn't. God's not paying attention anymore. The universe just runs according, you know, to natural law that he, God created. So a lot of American historians think um, Madison was a deist. Uh, you know, it was a very rational, the most rational version of religion you, you could get. And then certainly the Enlightenment's politics. Uh, Madison was, you know, liberal in the, in the classical sense of the term, a supporter of, of liberty, so uh, of individual rights. So you can see the influence. You know, his studying with Witherspoon at or the school that became Princeton, studying he, Witherspoon, your rights on Enlightenment expert, reading all these great Enlightenment thinkers, Thank God, you know, could say uh, that Madison was so influenced by the great thinkers of the Enlightenment and certainly played an enormous role in the, what John, what Joseph Ellis, I just, John, I just happened to have here, the American historian, oh, uh, Joseph Ellis, book, The Quartet. This is a very good book, by the way, on the, what, what Ellis calls the second American revolution, you know, the, the development of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we see the, you know, the Enlightenment principles of liberalism writ large, in the U.S. Constitution and then in the, in the, in the Bill of Rights. This is great stuff. You know, this is a great achievement. Especially today, John, when all these, all these Marxist terrorists who want to, you know, burning down American cities, they want to destroy the Constitution. They, you know, they, they, they have no regard for the Bill of Rights. They, what, what are they, what are they chanting in the streets of these Antifa and Black Lives Matter, you know, Marxist terrorists chanting death to America? I mean... That's like good. People are so insane today. More more than ever, when they want to cancel Madison because he was a slave owner, you know, which we'll discuss. They were, you know, we're going to cancel all of his achievements along with his along with his flaws, right? That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you know, Madison, he he knew that America had this one shot to create a republic, and uh, if they didn't get it right, it would be the death of republics in history. It wouldn't be tried again for for decades, if not centuries, maybe never. And so you got to think, yeah, this guy, he did own slaves and he was hypocritical in some respects. And he actually uh, made efforts to to uh, mitigate slavery. And, and you know, he was part of the, I think it was called the Virginia Colonization Society, uh, you know, on the premise that, well, we can't live peacefully side by side, but we can uh, make sure that they're uh, free and happy in another country. Um, but without someone like, like Madison, we wouldn't have re representative government and the institutions that these people are uh, today rallying against, uh, you know, the institutions of capitalism, the things that, that make our lives free and great wouldn't exist. So uh, Madison 
deserves uh, all due respect and, and great honors, and that's what we're here to do today. You know, right? Probably right. his biggest strength was. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. I just want to say, you know, um, so we're strong individualists. You know, you know, as Ayn Rand, you know, uh, Meyer is an objectivist. We're strong individual rights guys. Slavery, human slavery, obviously, a uh, you know despicable uh, violation of, of human rights to be condemned in no uncertain terms. So, you know, we, we deplore Madison's slave ownership and, you know, properly so, two thumbs down, you know, we, 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 we boo that. But people are often mixed cases and alongside this major flaw, there are these gigantic accomplishments in, in, in service of human liberty that we can't ignore or, or deplore, we have to celebrate. And yeah, you're right, I mean, Madison was visionary in this way, not visionary enough to be able to, uh, conceive of a biracial society. So uh, you're right, you're right. There was the, the he, he was one of the, one of those guys that, who helped found the, the colony of Liberia, right? In, um, in, in Africa for, for freed American slaves. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna emancipate the slaves and do away with slavery. Then you know, we, want, we want the former slaves to you know, be living in, in Africa, not the United States. So there's the downside of not being able to envision a, a biracial society, but there's the positive side of, Recognizing slavery is a horror, and um, the slaves are human beings who 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 deserve to be free, uh, even if uh, uh, if it's not here in the North American continent, you know, on the African continent. So, uh, yeah, we 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 vile slavery, you know, the the violations of of individual rights, but we're going to celebrate him for his great accomplishments in service of individual rights. Absolutely. If, if I recall correctly, too, wasn't Madison against the three-fifths compromise uh, during the Constitutional Convention? You know, this was something that was popular with slave states, but I believe Madison was, was against it. I think he was. Uh, 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 where they counted a slave as three-fifths of a person. Uh, yeah, I, 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 th I think he was, but I'm not enough of an expert on, on Madison to say. But I think, you know, John, I think we, we can concentrate on the real essentials here and get, let's, let's get to the Constitutional Convention. This is, uh, as I'm, I'm going to read a, a short passage from, from Joseph Ellis in, in just a minute. But Madison was one of the, uh, one of the early, you know, Joseph Ellis calls it the quartet, the, the, the foursome, Hamilton, Madison, Washington, John Jay, you know, who really drove the Constitutional Convention. Madison was one of the early uh, proponents of it, recognizing that the a, a loose confederation of states was, was would never actualize the potential that that we that could be uh, this country. You know, it, by a, a federation, by by one fed, one federation rather than you know a, a loose confederation. And Madison knew his history. The confederations in, in Europe always fell apart, you know, ended up in dissolving or in, or, or in civil war, of course, so did the United States. But, but I mean, it, it overcame, uh, the United States over, overcame that. So he was a strong proponent of, of, a, of a federation with, with a federal government, as was Hamilton, as was Washington, uh, as was uh, Jay. And what, so, so they wanted, he, for the Constitutional Convention, uh, and he recognized, Madison did, as did Hamilton, uh, Washington's former, you know, aide de camp during the War of, of Independence, that without Washington's participation, the, the the Constitutional Convention would never get off the ground. And they started a courtship. They wooed Washington. You know, Washington Washington agreed with them, but he wasn't so sure that this thing that this thing was was going to work. And they, you know, they they courted him, John. They they wooed him, and they finally convinced him to, yeah, you. Know, what is an American historian? Was it, Gary, was it Gary Wills, who one of them, who called Washington a, like a, something like a, a maestro of resignation or something, something like that? He resigned his command in the army, and then he resigned from the presidency after two years. Basically, Washington wanted to be left alone on his farm, <laughs> you know, and live the life of a gentleman farmer, although he also, unfortunately, was a slave owner. But Madison and Hamilton you know, prevailed upon him. You're the guy. You're the guy. You're the you're the leading you're the leading figure 
in the United States, in this, well, it wasn't the United States. You're the leading figure in this, in the, in, you know, in this confederation, loose confederation of states. If we're going to have a federal government, you have to preside over it. You are, ultimately, you have to be present. So they wooed, they wooed Washington to preside over the Constitutional Convention. Yeah, Washington had the preeminent reputation, of course, in the United States, having won the Revolutionary War. And without his support, which he was willing to give, but he didn't want to give it, uh, you know, freely without, without knowing that this thing was going to work. So Madison, I believe, was the one writing to him and saying, you know, these are the people that are coming. These are their positions. Here are sort of how the votes are going to lay out. He was doing his research there on the ground and, and uh, letting Washington know, and they were extremely close. Some say that uh, Madison was closer to Washington than he ever was to Jefferson. And uh, of course, Madison and Jefferson were the best of friends uh, when people wanted to correspond right. with that. Uh, yeah. Right, right. And later on, I'm, I'm gonna read this, this passage from, from Ellis, but later on, when uh, Washington is the first president and he, Washington wants Madison to run for the US Senate, from the state of Virginia, he wants him to be in the, you know, in the in the Senate. But it, but but Patrick Henry controlled the machinations in Virginia, and he 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 and Madison disagreed on this. He blocked Madison from being a senator, uh, and so Madison ran for the House. I think I think against Monroe, uh, ran for the House of Representatives, yeah, and you know, and yeah, won. Yeah, and uh, James Monroe, and he won, and became one. Of, even though he wasn't a cabinet member, he was in the House of Representatives. But he was considered not only like the leading man in the House because of his role with the Constitution, but he was had Washington's ear. Washington won, wisely wanted Madison's advice on many different issues because, funny thing, he figured Madison knew what the Constitution <laughs> said and allowed and anybody else did, right? I mean, you know, well, he wrote it, so he, should, he, he was the lead author, so he should, uh, he should know it better than anybody. But get this. Yeah. And by the way, yeah. it's Joseph Ellis's book, The Quartet. Ellis, John, and everybody is a, is a really good writer. And I, you know, I, you know, I recommend El Ellis uh, as an American historian. His book, Founding Brothers, you know, is, is, is very famous. But, but here, his, his, uh, to, to this point about wooing Washington, everything now depended on what happened in Philadelphia. And that, in turn, depended to a great degree on the presence of America's most indispensable character. After some last-minute second thoughts about the wisdom of it all, Washington rode out of Mount Vernon in early May. His very presence certified the significance of the occasion, as did his willingness to risk his reputation in order to rescue the American Revolution from its own excesses. As for what he referred to as a remedy, that was Madison's department. And one would be pressed to find anywhere, anyone else on the planet with Madison's unique combination of political savvy, psychological intensity, and cerebral power. This would be his finest hour. Good stuff, right? Yeah, this would go good stuff leading up to the, to the, con the, to the constitutional uh, a convention. Now, yeah, so Madison gets I, there, you know, before anyone or any of the out of towners, right? And he's there with his Virginia plan and sort of says, well, why don't we do this? Sort of sets the stage for the entire debate, no? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Virginia plan really does. You're, you're, you're right, John. Um, Madison's plan, which is, was called the Virginia plan, really set the template for. You know, for the for the constitutional debate, and though Madison wasn't satisfied with how many compromises he you know he had to make uh, in, in order to get ultimately get the Constitution uh, composed and approved, you know, by the by the convention. Nevertheless, it was the Virginia Plan that set the template for it. It was um, some of Madison some of Madison's key ideas: the you know, separation of powers, the different branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial. Uh, comes out of Madison's Virginia plan, the bicameral legislature, you having the Senate and the House, where the House, you know, uh, represent, uh, uh, based on, on on population, and the Senate, you know, every every state has two senators, 
Uh, Madison hadn't worked out any detail yet what he thought about the executive branch, but he did believe in one chief executive. Uh, and of course, as with everybody else in the country, wanted a very reluctant George Washington to be the country's first uh, chief executive. So there's a, a great deal of the of his Virginia plan that ultimately went into the into the U.S. Constitution, although he was dissatisfied with things that got that got well, cut out. One of the things he was dissatisfied with was actually that the Senate was uh, proportional state representation. I believe he wanted that to be. Uh, based on population as well, same as the House, so that the larger states would have more power in the Senate. Uh, he wanted the Senate to handle foreign policy. You know, he didn't really thought about some of the things that Hamilton and uh, perhaps even Washington had thought about in terms of having a Secretary of State and, and how the executive branch, like you said, would work. Uh, so he thought the Senate would have uh, that sort of power. He also thought that there'd be a, another body a revision body that would handle vetoes and that could veto laws. So yeah, but the, the basics of his system were there and he was like all 39 delegates to the Constitutional Convention. He was not fully, uh, not fully happy with the, with the end results. I know well, you wanted to talk about Franklin. I think Franklin had something to say on this. But yeah, he should. Sure. Nevertheless, I will. Go ahead. He nevertheless put his, uh, you know, his, he put his full force behind getting it ratified after the fact. But we, we can talk right. about, too, the fact that Madison was the most, uh, the most detailed note taker of anyone at the Constitutional Convention. So the records that we have today largely come from Madison. Um, he also spoke more than anyone at the Constitutional Convention, aside from Governor Morris and James Wilson. So he was... Uh, constantly, you know, one of the things that people say about him, uh, he, he was a genius, but he was always the best prepared in any room, no matter who else was in the room. He had done his homework. He knew more than anyone. And he was ready to, to debate anyone on anything. And so, uh, you know, he, he certainly helped steer the Constitutional Convention, not only by coming up with the, the basic plan, but then doing as, as much as he could to retain that plan. Now, he, he obviously lost some battles, but by and large, the structure that he came up with in the Virginia plan is what, uh, what got instituted in the Constitution. Right. That, you're, you're right, John. And it's because of, of that, the Virginia plan serving as a template for the U.S. Constitution. And then, like you said, he was one of the most active members in the Constitution, speaking, you know, and, you know thinking and, and, and speaking and, and arguing on this constantly. You know, for those two reasons, he's often referred to as the father of the U.S. Constitution. And I think, you know, I think that's an accolade that's well deserved in, in, in Madison, in Madison's case. So he's not, you're right, he's not, he's not happy with it. Washington wasn't particularly happy with it. I don't know if anybody was really happy with it, but Benjamin Franklin, uh, who was, you know, in his 80s by this time and suffering from gout and various ailments. But Franklin had something to say. I'll quote Ellis, Joseph Ellis quotes Franklin, so I'll just read it. Uh, um, this is Ellis speaking before he quotes uh, Fra Franklin. There was an unspoken consensus that he, Franklin, was the wisest man in the room. He lived up reputation on the last day of the convention with remarks Again, delivered by Wilson, as James Wilson, Pennsylvania colleague, because Franklin was, you know, in, in, in his age, <clears throat> uh, that were both elegantly pragmatic and politically profound. Quote from Benjamin Franklin, I confess that I do not entirely approve this Constitution at present, but, sir, I am not sure I shall never approve. But having lived long, I have experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration, to change opinions on important subjects, which I once thought right, but found to be otherwise. It is therefore that the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. In these sentiments, sir, I agree to this Constitution with all its faults, if they are such, because I think a general government necessary for us I doubt, too, whether any other convention we could obtain may be able to make a better constitution. It therefore astonishes me, sir, 
to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does, and I think it will astonish our enemies who are waiting with confidence to hear that our councils are confounded, like those of the builders of Babel, and that our states are on the point of separation, only to meet hereafter for the purpose of cutting one another's throats. <laughs> Thus I could send, sir, to this constitution, because I expect no better, and I am not sure that it is not the best. Unquote from Benjamin Franklin. And I think over, over 200 years you know, subsequent to that, I think Franklin's judgment has been vindicated. Uh, it may be, but it, 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 may, it, it, may, it is also the best. It's the best constitution, especially when augmented by the Bill of Rights. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was, you know, Franklin was afraid that all these delegates would go back to their, their hometowns, their home states, and just badmouth it. Because, like, like we said, everyone was slightly disappointed with how it turned out. They wanted, everyone had a, a different image in their head of what would be perfect. And, of course, those in the north versus those in the south had very different images. And it was a, a hard thing to do just to get them to agree to this union, to, to agree to these measures in the Constitution. So <clears throat> Franklin was right. rightfully uh, uh, cautious about how to uh, go about sending people back home, and he hoped that everyone would, would go back home and, and wisely talk their state conventions, their state ratifying conventions, into ratifying the Constitution. And of course, Virginia was one of the most important states, and it was also one of the most contentious, where James Madison had to go head to head with his chief nemesis throughout much of his life, Patrick Henry, who happened to be the best order on this side of the Atlantic in that day. Jefferson, who was no fan of Patrick Henry, said that he spoke like Homer wrote, which was just the uh, <laughs> great kudos to, to Patrick Henry's ability to speak. And I think it, it was Ellis, and maybe even in that book, who said that the Virginia ratifying convention was one of the most important political events in history. If Virginia didn't yeah. ratify, uh, you, know, Virginia, you can imagine a U.S. Without, without Virginia at that point, even if other states had, you know, Virginia didn't ratify, then Washington could be president. What would have happened then? That's right. So, yeah, that, Madison's that's right. Had the, the debate with, uh, with Patrick Henry back in Virginia. And, you know, Patrick Henry, like we said, was this brilliant orator. So he'd get up and give this just stunning speech for his point of view. And Madison would get up and say, well, yeah, but we're actually addressing this section of the Constitution, uh, which says this. And what you're saying is not related. So if you could, just please keep your, your remarks uh, confined <laughs> to the thing that we're actually discussing. And <laughs> yeah. He, yeah, brilliant speech, Patrick, but off topic. But yeah, there's so, there's so many. <laughs> There's so many important points here. Of, you know, of first of all, before you, first of all, um, the, the what what Franklin said is it was absolutely true, and Jefferson was aware of this. In, in as the minister in France, there were people all across Europe who wanted to see the the American Republic fail. They wanted to see it fail because they you know, they supported monarchy or, or or aristocracy, and they wanted to say this is this is what happens when you know you try and let the common man you know uh, run the country. Madison very well aware, as was Washington, that he was operating on a world stage. That if 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 the American Republic failed, like you said, there would there might not be another republic for for God knows how long. And he kept copious notes at the Constitutional Convention because he knew he was he was this was being done one for present day America, but two for posterity. And uh, yeah, and everybody who knew Madison said he was always the most prepared man in the in the room. And so he's got to go, hey, this is dramatic, and Ellis describes it beautifully. He's got to go head to head with Patrick Henry, the greatest speaker. And, and Madison, at least as described by Ellis, was kind of nerdy, not just, you know, he was a little guy and not a lot of energy and not a booming voice like Patrick Henry. But Ellis says he kept his notes in his hat and would pull his notes out and refer to them like, you know, like he was some kind of some kind of nerdy professor. But uh, John Marshall. Another a fellow Virginian who knew them both well, right? 
famous as Chief Justice of the, of the United States Supreme Court, Marshall said that Patrick Henry was the most persuasive speaker I ever heard, but James Madison was the most convincing. You know, and I, I think that <laughs> distinction is, you know, I think the distinction there is, you know, Henry was brilliant and he was emotionally charged and, you know, he just had a, he had a lot of fire. But Madison uh, had the facts, the figures, the logic. Not that Henry wasn't logical, but Madison was like impeccable. Uh, facts, figures, logic appeal, uh, appeal powerfully to the rational mind. Not so much your emotions, but to the rational mind. At the end of the day, the most prepared man in the room won uh, against the greatest speaker uh, uh, of, his, of, of his day. And Virginia narrowly ratified, I think, what was it, 89 to 79, I think, the, the ratification vote, you know, in favor of ratification in the state of Virginia. But we should also talk about the Federalist Papers, John, you're leading up to the ratification yeah. debate. That's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, so, of course, Alexander Hamilton, after the Constitutional Convention, planned the Federalist Papers, and he was going to partner with John Jay to write these. And they were writing to the common man to tell them, to tell people, this is why we need to ratify this Constitution. Of course, they were responding to uh, Brutus and other writers whose papers became known as the uh, Anti-Federalist Papers, lesser known today, but extremely important documents in American history. So Hamilton plans this series of papers in defense of the Constitution, and John Jay actually quickly drops out. I think he wrote maybe five of them. And, uh, and, and Hamilton and Madison at this time were extremely close, extremely tight, which is important for what happens later. But uh, Madison and, and Hamilton at this point were of one mind. And so Hamilton enlists Madison to help him write these Federalist Papers. And these are some of the most important documents in political history, in world political history. This is some of the most lucid thinking on politics. Now, there are gems strewn throughout many, uh, many, 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 uh, I actually forget the total number, something like over 100, right? Uh, Federalist papers. Uh, and many of these most powerful ones, of course, came from Madison. And this became a guidebook for debaters who were, were then debating whether or not to ratify this constitution in the, uh, in the state conventions. Some, some today say that the importance of the Federalist Papers is overstated and, and that it may not have uh, really swayed debate in states other than New York and Virginia, which, uh, where they were also, also published. Originally, they were published in New York and then republished in Virginia. Um, but even if they swayed only New York and Virginia to come in uh, on the side of the Constitution without those states, as we said, no, no President George Washington, if no Virginia, and if no New York, uh, who knows? Yeah, New York City would certainly never have grown into the commercial center it did, I think, if it wasn't part of the United States, although they, they certainly could have you know, joined later. But yeah, yeah, two points there for sure. Uh, you're, one, you're absolutely right. The Federalist, the, the Federalist Papers are among the most brilliant writings in, in the whole history of political science. And, and they're widely, Hamilton and Madison uh, wrote several brilliant essays uh, uh, you know, in, in, in support of a federation, uh, you know, rather than a loose confederation of states. And, and again, yeah, I think you mentioned, John, a number of these essays were, were published in newspapers. They were you know, read by every man and you know and, and every woman back at you know back in the day. It showed uh, you know it showed the the level of literacy you know that that existed in 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 the country back then dur during the 18th century Enlightenment. Because if I had my college students you know in a philosophy class read the you know say in the in the Intro to philosophy class in a section on political philosophy. Read the read the Fed, the essays of the Federalists. It's gonna it's gonna go over. Sadly, it's gonna go over a lot of the heads, you know, uh, of these kids, you know, who are on the cusp of graduating college. So, uh, which is sad about the education levels today. But it's one it's one data point showing us that the educational levels were substantially higher uh, in Enlightenment America than in in late 20th or 21st century America. But yeah, all kudos to Hamilton who conceived of this project and to Madison 
because both of them wrote contributed brilliant essays to you know to, to the Federalist Papers. Absolutely brilliant. So yeah, so they may not have settled the argument, but they were uh, they, they certainly helped it in, in Virginia and New York, and they're still worth reading today. And I think the, those college students ought to get to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're not ready now, but hopefully, you know, as they're out in the work world for a few years, people mature emotionally. I think they gain they gain knowledge. I do think I do think emotional maturity helps intellectual uh, maturity and take these issues more seriously. So in the future, uh, perhaps they will. But one of the uh, good points from the anti ratifiers. Patrick Henry, you know, chief amongst them is we need a bill of rights. You know, there's, there, there's Henry spoke. Henry, Henry you know, Patrick Henry and his supporters had a, had a point. You know, the, the spirit of 76, as it was known, uh, was against strong centralized government that's far away and a concern that if we have a, you know, a strong federal government in, you know, even then 13 states, was still far flung, especially back then when there was no road, barely yet, no roads, you know, and anything, and certainly no, certainly no trains or planes or, or cars or anything to, to get get around. No telephone, <laughs> never mind, never mind the internet. So if uh, if the government's going to be, if the federal government would be centered, let, say, let's say originally in New York, uh, how would the government in New York know the concerns of you know New England whalers or farm farmers in Georgia or you know, hardy pioneers pushing through the Cumberland Gap. Henry and his supporters were afraid that, you know, a centralized government like that, uh, uh, that's far removed from the concern, the day-to-day -day concerns of many Americans would be as unaware and uncaring uh, of, the, of the concerns of American citizens as, as was Parliament and the, and the king. You know, we, we, we just fought a war of independence to overthrow one powerful, far away government. We, now we're going to install another one. So. You, know, you could understand the concern, the true respect. You gotta love the period at that time. They want to limit the power of the government. You know, I mean, it's so different than today. They really want to limit the power of the government, protect individual rights, you know, uphold the spirit of 1776. And so Madison promised, he was opposed to it at first, but he promised, I think he came to recognize the importance of it. He came to, he, and he promised, a bill of rights that would, would, be, would be added to the Constitution. And he delivered, didn't he? Yeah, several things happened, you know, running up to this. Roger Sherman, they were in the, the waning days of the Constitutional Convention, and they thought about adding a bill of rights. And Roger Sherman said, well, uh, the states have bill of rights. The states already have that covered, so we're, we're kind of covered. We don't need to worry about that. And, and Madison thought, well, we've just designed this incredible Constitution that says what the government can and cannot do. And if we look at this and we go by the book, then the government clearly cannot violate the rights that we're talking about putting in a Bill of Rights. It just can't happen. So it doesn't need it. But, you know, he, he talked to Jefferson. Jefferson was really key in persuading him of this. Jefferson said, yeah, we ought to have a Bill of Rights. And also the Virginia Baptists who had been persecuted by the Anglican Church and who had found a friend in Madison from his very early days in politics. And the, you know, the, the Baptists were still being persecuted and they wanted uh, protections built into the constitution as well. And so Madison came to see in time that, you know, it, it's not gonna hurt anything if we do add this bill of rights. And in fact, what it might do is might fix in people's minds, the idea that they have these constitutional rights that cannot be uh, overrun by an overreaching government. And that's going to be helpful when, uh, you know, this thing gets off the ground and you know, political changes start to happen and we might have different people in power that might not hold our ideals. So we, we need a responsive public. We really need public opinion on the side of these rights and what will help do that. Uh, it, it will help to have these things in writing for everyone to know about. Uh, he also uh, he also thought that um, that the uh, sorry I lost my train of thought there. The um, well, you got a you got a large track there with several trains running on it, buddy. So you know I could see why. <laughs> <laughs> 
see why the train schedules <laughs> might conflict. But um, yeah, I lost yeah, that. I lost that one. But uh, we'll, maybe I'll think of it later. There's other there's other trains coming. Don't worry. But um, you know, the Baptist <laughs> just picking up what the Baptist just picking up on what you were saying couldn't have found a better guy to to appeal to because Madison uh, preeminently Madison and his buddy Thomas Jefferson. They were strong believers in religious freedom, and they had, you know, they had composed the Virginia Statute, you know, of, of religious freedom. In fact, it's one of the three uh, things Jefferson put on his tombstone, you know, that he thought was that was was that Jefferson put on his tombstone because he thought it was that important. Religious freedom was that important, and they're right. I mean, our, our late unlamented friends at ISIS, <laughs> you know, a real example of what happens when, when religious people don't believe in, in, in religious freedom, and of course. The American founders were descendants in many cases of people who fled the religious wars, you know, the, hor the horrific religious wars in, uh, in Europe. So Madison was a strong believer in religious, religious freedom. So as the first man in the House, uh, after Washington sworn in as president, and, the, you know, his, Washington's inaugurated and the Congress is inaugurated, Madison set about writing uh, the Bill of Rights. And I know... The first part of the First Amendment, which says, quote, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or restrict a free exercise thereof, unquote. This establishment clause, right, there'll be no official state-sponsored, state-mandated, state-backed religion in this country, just like he and Jefferson had said in, in Virginia, you know, uh, disenfranchising the Anglican Church in Virginia. There's not going to be any official church here, no Church of England, no Church of America. Uh, and of course, restrict the Congress shall make no laws that can restrict the free exercise thereof. Well, it can't get any clearer than that. Religious freedom, of course, uh, enormously important to, to Madison. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, most Americans know the First Amendment as the as a freedom of speech amendment, which it certainly is. A lot of them don't realize it's also the freedom of religion you know, amendment. So we should talk about freedom of speech, John, a little bit, don't you think? Since uh, it's so rare in many places around the world, even civilized countries like the UK. You know, thank God we have it here when the leftists want to suppress us uh, uh, vehemently. We should, talk about, we should talk about freedom of speech. Yeah, James Madison was uh, very keen to have uh, a, a amendment. You know, if we're going to have amendments, let's definitely have one talking about speech. Uh, you know, he's horrified at what was happening to the, the Baptists in large part because he was a man of the mind. He understood that his own life was directed by his own his own mental uh, world. The, the things that he thought, he wanted to, to be able to act on those things. And he saw that others were being punished for, for thinking and acting on their own, their own thinking. And so he wanted to make sure that this, this couldn't happen. And freedom of speech and freedom of the press, of course, became key issues uh, in the second presidency of the United States, John Adams's presidency. And, uh, you know, I don't want to jump the gun here, but uh, this is another instance in which Madison really shines and shows his, his devotion to the spirit of 76, his devotion to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. Um, so, uh, right, right to yeah. peaceful assembly. You may not can't burn down Minneapolis or Portland or Seattle, but you can peacefully assemble, right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So what did you want to say on, on uh, Madison's thoughts on freedom of speech, Andy? Well, again, again I, I, the, it's really, it's called freedom of speech, which is an accurate term, but it's really, I think the deeper and more accurate way to look at it is it's freedom of intellectual expression. It's freedom of the mind. You know, uh, the, the mind cannot be curtailed by a dictator uh, internally, you know, I can, I can, I can pretend to go along with whatever the dictator says, but in my own mind, you know, know that he's wrong and, you know, and, and identify the truth. But if I can't speak it, if I can't express it, if I can't write about it, speak it, lecture on it, then, you know, my, my freedoms are restricted and, you know, the freedom to disseminate ideas, to reach other minds, to convince them, uh, is, you know, if they're going to kill me you know, for speaking my mind, then, uh, then my, then the free, the freedom of, of uh, the freedom of intellectual expression 
is enormously important to uh, you know to uh, uh, sustaining freedom in the country. We need to be we need let's put it this way: we need to have an open debate of ideas, which is that's what's so wrong with the left today. You know, so often they'll, they'll just call you a racist because you disagree with them and try and shut you down. They'll try to cancel you. You know, try try and get you fired from a university position because you reject man-made warming, or because you you stand up for colorblind individualism. Uh, you reject that brand of racism. It's so wrong at so many different levels. You know, a free society needs an open debate of ideas. All ideas can be can be freely expressed, and a rational mind can weigh them and see the ones that you know that that are congruent congruent with reality. So, Madison, you know, the freedom of speech. Uh, segment of the First Amendment is really freedom of the mind in action, your freedom of the mind to speak um, its ideas and you know communicate them, write books and you know something. I had a, I had a great example is the is the difference. What would have happened with Ayn Rand if she had ha had to stay in the Soviet Union, as as opposed to what Ayn Rand was able to accomplish in the United States? Maybe maybe she could have locked herself in a cellar somewhere and, and written the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. She could publish, then they kill her. They send her to a gulag, and then they burn. You know, and they they just they would destroy the they would destroy the books. This is what happens to great thinkers. You know, when they're locked in a totalitarian state. You know, original thinkers in a free country, though, you can revolutionize the, uh, write the greatest novels in world literature, and revolutionize the field of of philosophy. And that's part of you know, publishing Atlas Shrugged is part of freedom of intellectual expression that James Madison so fervently, you know, stood for. So for, if for no other reason, John, I'm going to salute, we deplore him as a slave owner and a hypocrite for that, but we uh, celebrate his uh, his glorious achievements in, in service of, you know, uh, uh, freedom of the mind. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, do you think we have time to talk a bit about what happens um after his, his terms as uh, a representative in the U.S. House of Representatives? Well, I mean, we, I think we, we, we could, I, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't know if it's even necessary, because this is Madison's, like Joseph Ellis said, this is his, his finest hour. It, it, it's amazing. The guy, the, the, he was a Secretary of State. He was a two-term two U.S. president, all of which, you know, would make him, you know, possibly immortal in history, but his... His his shining hour, Ellis is right, really came when he was in his thirties, you know, with the with the US US Constitution and the and the Bill of Rights. Nevertheless, you know, he did serve in the House, was a secretary he was Secretary of State in Jefferson's administration, wasn't he? And then and then two term president. president. Yeah, I, I know and and that was when the Louisiana Purchase was made. So so Madison, the Secretary of State, must have been involved you know, with the Louisiana Purchase, which greatly expanded the, the size of the United States. Uh, I don't really have anything to say on, on that part of, of Madison's career, but if you want to, if you want to wrap it up with a nice bow on it, you know, with this, uh, this material, I think you should, I think you should go ahead. Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of historians do sort of stop with, with uh, 1789 and, and the Bill of Riots being Madison's crowning achievements, and these, from our perspective today, certainly were some of the most important. But I think there are a few things to say, and um, I just want to give one, one highlight that I think speaks to the character of James Madison. You know, we're talking about this short, shy Virginian, very bookish, no military experience, of course, and he happens to be uh, president during the War of 1812. And, you know, this war comes about because the British are uh, impressing American sailors and forcing them to work on British ships. Uh, they are just attacking uh, American uh, shipping and not allowing Americans to trade with France. And so they, uh, uh, sorry, Madison and his administration realized that this is really the second coming of the War of Independence, and in that you know the only way to get this this uh, monkey off our back, so to speak, is to to go back to war. Let's go back head to head with this world's greatest superpower. We've already defeated them once, and mm -hmm. we're still this tiny nation. But um, this uh, th this one scene comes from uh, Richard Brookheiser's book on Madison. He talks about 
uh, let's see, it was the morning of August 24th, 1814, when the British were marching, and some thought they were going to Maryland, others thought they were going to D.C. first to torch the capital. And Madison, again, no military experience, uh, just he's, he's not a commander in that sense, doesn't really have the, uh, a hold of, of hold of himself in, in that way, but nonetheless is determined to defend America. And so he borrows some pistols and a horse, he suits up and he goes to what he thinks is going to be the battlefield in, in Maryland. But uh, unfortunately, the uh, British did march on the White House and burn it. But you've got to you've got to just step back in, in awe of Madison and his character for doing that. You know, here was a guy who he, he didn't have the expertise in this, but he wasn't going to stand there. He, he was gritty, and this was one of his greatest aspects. Was when you knock him down, he gets back up, and he, he gets back up every time, and he consistently fights for what he believes in, and, and he did it this day as in so many others. So. Um, yeah, I think that's a good parting thought for Madison, this incredible father of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and a true American hero. Yeah, Madison certainly is one of the giants, one of the leading giants of America's revolutionary period for all the all the reasons we, we gave. And so I think we'd always we salute his heroism. Uh, and John, I think I'm going to wish you to, to lead a more heroic, have a heroic day, lead a heroic life, and to save everybody out there in hero land. We'll see you next week. We'll be back with the Hero Show. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, everybody. Heroic.